everybody. Uh, thank you, first of all, to uh, Head Investors for organising yet another really good event. The presentations have been very interesting and brought a lot of food for thought so far, and I hope I will be able to add to that. Um, my name is Sara Dario, and I'm heading up the uh, helicopter practice at SN by Syria. Uh, firstly, and as I am sure you have noticed, we have a new name, a new brand. Um, for us at the Send is very much business as usual, apart from the fact that we can use a lot of different colours in our presentations. So um, hopefully that will clear up a little bit this morning. Um, this is our team as it looks today. We're close to 30 analysts over three offices. Um, if anybody wants to know more about the rebranding, we've got an exhibit stand with some uh, material on it, or come and talk to ourselves, um, the Syrian team on site. Um, so, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk, take you through a few slides to review the fleet over time and the subsequent value development. Um, we're going to deep down a little bit <coughs> into the uh, um, oil and gas sector, and then we're going to put um, the Send by Syrian fleet forecast to the test. We're going to look at the very first one we did back in 2013 and compare what we said then to what we've seen in, in 2019. Um, we are going to look at some of the lessons that we've learned and also some of the turbulence that we've got moving forward, something to consider for, for everybody in the industry. Um, so, this chart shows the fleet growth per sector since 2000. So the interesting bit with, with this slide is that you can see that all of the sectors has actually had growth in the last uh, 20 years, uh, apart from one sector, which is the oil and gas sector. Um, the dip here seems really, really small in on, on this slide in relation to everything else, but it did cause, as we know, a lot of turmoil, mainly because of the uh, value of the assets that are operating in this sector and the subsequent um, impact for the finance community. So let's look into the oil and gas sector in a little bit more detail. Some of you have seen this slide before. It shows the fleet development against the active rig, count, um, rig patterns over time. And we can see quite a stark correlation between uh, oil rigs and the use of helicopters. Um, the significant drop that you can see in 2016 is largely caused by the H225 grounding. Um, and in normal circumstances, um, one would have imagined that that would have had a positive effect for the rest of the fleet operating in that sector. Um, but what we went on to observe was uh, continued excess and continued value declines. This shows the heavy value development uh, over time. This is only focused on the 92 and the 225. Um, I've only drawn the um, trend line for the 92 because we were know that the 225 had events that was a little bit outside of, of that pattern. Um, but despite the fact that it had a monopoly in the market, the values had continued to decline. Uh, looking at the um, usage role, we have seen the 225 in particular has been very interesting because we've seen that it's had real difficulty transitioning to another usage area, uh, which is due to its size and also due to the cost and time of conversion and also the absorption in, in which other usages can actually use this machine. We're starting to see this happen a little bit more now. Um, utility of Wi-Fi thing was just mentioned, could be great opportunities for this machine, but not at the values that we saw at the height of the uh, oil and gas upturn. Um, so, this shows the mediums. Um, I've chosen three mediums to show. I've, I've chosen the 76C++, the 139 and the H145C2. Um, the C++ and the 139s are both strong features in the offshore sector, um, but we have different 
value behaviors. So while the C++ has plummeted, the 135 has had more of an expected depreciation curve. Um, the C2 is a type not what the, that doesn't have a lot of exposure to the offshore sector. And again, we can see that trend line behaving similar to the 139 in that it's, it's more an expected depreciation line. Um, so what, why, why is it that they have behaved differently? Well, one thing is that at the upturn, when, when the oil price is really shot up and what we can see in the first slide, um, the recount slide, is that there was, there was a lack of demand in that. There was an undersupply at that point, which pushed prices up because we needed, the industry needed more helicopters, orders were made, and, and the C++ in particular had a really steep upturn at that time, and therefore now when the uh, niche demand for that helicopters has uh, diminished, we see a bigger value decline for the C++ than we do for the others. Um, the other really interesting observation is usage roles. So we can see quite a good correlation between uh, the exposure, the amount of exposure the helicopter type has to different usage roles. So. The C++ had almost over 70 or just under 70% market share in the uh, offshore sector back in 2018. That the very purpose of the 76 series was to serve the, the offshore industry specifically. As the niche base, as I already said, uh, disappeared, it proved difficult to shift the machine to another usage and the pool of availability continued to grow, which subsequently put a lot of pressure on the values. Now, if we look at the 139, this is a much more versatile asset and had an even more, uh, more even share in several sectors, which helped to offset the decline in demand in the offshore industry. It also had a more clear proven secondary marker. In the case of the C2, it had next to no exposure to offshore, uh, and we can see that value dep depreciation is, is more in line with, with expected depreciation. The conclusion here then is that diverse assets is a really good foundation for stability. We've also seen the market react to this. So this shows the least helicopter fleet usage trends. And we can see uh, back in 14-15, the lesser fleet is heavily exposed to offshore, but over time they've started to diversify. Now there's a bit of a strange dip here in 2016 and that's almost largely due to the 225. Um, so this slide looks at fleet per sector. So whilst the SAR, the SAR portion looks very, very small, in value terms it's quite significant that the machines tend to be of the larger sizes heavily equipped. So now let's put the uh, SM fleet forecast to the test. That's it. This is what we. Um, this is the difference of what we forecasted back in 2013. The reason we compare it to 2013 is because it was our first forecast, and I've chosen to look at it by segment and to focus on markets core to investors like yourselves. As you can see, our forecast for these segments missed the mark by an average of 224 aircraft, translating to 13% margin, uh, driven by uh, the offshore sector. If we remove the offshore sector, however, the average accuracy across the segments was 4%. I think this is interesting in showing how the different segments has performed in the last sort of five, six years. And it demonstrates the severe turbulence in the offshore sectors, which have led to behaviors we have not observed before. But the overall, overall, the industry has performed largely as one would expect. So what have we learned? Well, one thing that we've learned is that the recovery pattern was not a U shape as one would expect. It was more of an L shape. This is an indication that we now have to find the new normal in this industry. Another thing we learned is the strong correlation between oil prices and the use of helicopters. 
We've worked with the assumption that oil production is required even in a downturn. We also work with the notion that the cost of using helicopters were relatively small for an oil company and would remain largely the same. However, as the downturn continued, the oil companies had to rationalise their entire operations and change their approach to costs. We started observing behaviour which haven't be previously been seen, including the biggest decommission project of oil rigs in history. Uh, many of the decommissioned platforms were those requiring specialised helicopters, such as the 76 and the heavies. Another key thing that happened was the emergence of the leasing community. Of course, well, they have been around before, but they had been around before, but not in the same capacity. Were they a help or a hinder? Well, 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 I think we're going to see eventually, but initially, initial indications uh, indicates that the, the oversupply would have been a lot, lot greater, would it not have been for the lessors. They managed to move some fleet around, convert them into different segments. Um, the very nature of a lessor's business is to keep aircraft moving and they, they work really hard to do so. Right. But all this said, are there parameters that could have made the industry able to anticipate this overcapacity earlier and how did we mitigate the risk moving forward? Well, this is our current forecasting model. Much of this is based on historical data and as we can see so far, it hasn't been bad parameters, but when previously unobserved <coughs> events happen, it jeopardizes historical analysis. Some of the key unknowns we, we currently see on the horizon has been uh, mentioned quite a lot in this forum already, but let's go through them seeing I've already made the slide. Um, technology. How will this help shape the future of the industry? Does it bring new efficiencies? If so, what are they? Which industry and or which heli type of helicopter is it likely to impact? And in what, we, what way? A change to useful economic life assumptions. This is a real possibility, as we now have more types than ever in the market. If there is a change, how will that affect your investment? Will it differ between industry sectors and for size categories? This is work that we're looking at at the moment at this end, and, and hopefully we'll reach some sort of conclusion shortly, but because most of the fleet hasn't yet retired, it is quite a difficult task. Uh, to, to conclude. Climate crisis, what does that mean for the helicopter industry? Well, flight shaming could be a real thing for the corporate sector, while significant reduction in the reliance on fossil fuels will obviously have an effect on the offshore sector. Industry changes, we're currently seeing cons consolidation for both offshore operators and lessors. The EMS sector is finding challenges with revenue model. What's likely to happen in different sectors and will it have a positive or negative impact on the segment in which your fleet is working? We also have regulatory changes. What's on the horizon? How will that impact your fleet? What would happen if China opened its airspace to be more accommodating to EMS and SAR operations, for example? This slide and, and these questions are obviously not exhaustive, but it's some of the things that we need to think about with moving forward. So to conclude, we have seen that different market segments have different drivers of growth. The effect of turbulence is very difficult to forecast and it may be possible to incorporate additional indicators, but what do we choose? Utilisation perhaps, lease, lease rates would be great. And I'd like to address Ed's point uh, here. Um, Steve Robinson's data is brilliant, but it doesn't show us what the values are. Without data points and without hearing of the trends that you have in the market, we can't possibly as a crisis affect reality. Um, I've noticed over time uh, this industry is come, becoming more and more closed. People do not want to talk about safe prices, lease rates. Um, and that makes it very, very difficult for the industry. So for us to be able to reflect reality, um, we need to have these conversations. And we need to ask a lot of questions about the transactions. We need to understand them. 
in a bit more detail. So do, do, do take some time to speak to us about it. And that will ultimately change um, the, the, the current market values as we've got them today. Diversification of asset portfolio is the best risk mitigator. It appears from the data that we've got to hand that having a diverse portfolio operating in different segments made up of different asset types is indeed the best form of risk mitigation. Um, this is mainly because the segments do react differently to different uh, events that happen. There is a lot of turbulence ahead that has the potential to change the landscape in which we operate and anticipating this change is key. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening and open any floors to questions that you may have. Do we have any questions? <coughs> well, it's all. Any questions or comments? That was pretty.